Good morning, everybody, from the Rotex factory here in Austria. This morning, I am joined with Hannes and Andreas. And can you tell us a little bit about what the process is, what you'll take us through on this uh, okay. tour? So, first of all, glad to have you here. That's really great, a good opportunity to show also our premises, our production facilities. And uh, we will cover, first of all, the history where everything started with BRP, but also going a little bit into how the whole stories of aircraft engines uh, came to life and uh, later on we are first seeing the assembly operation uh, followed by our manufacturing and machining operations. So this is the first thing we see as we enter the factory. What am I seeing here? Yeah, why do we show you this? That is mainly our history, our name, where it comes from. So uh, as you know, we had our 100 years celebration in 2020 and here you see back down in the 1920s the so-called rotating axle so where the name is coming from, so it's Rotex. So it really was used at that time for the bicycle racing and so on. And from where the history started with uh, Friedrich Gottschalk, a German guy, patented this one. So from this side, our history started this way. Now you know where the name is coming from. Yes, and as the name suggests, BRP Rotex, I mean BRP. Rotex was already explained by Hannes just uh, a moment ago and BRP stands for Bombardier Recreational Products and one of the first or the first product where Bombardier uh, BRP is uh, most well known for is Skidoo, right? And uh, this company was founded in the 1940s and of course such a vehicle, such an innovative vehicle at the time also needs a combustion engine. This is where the ways of um, both companies intersected and just uh, after a short period of time of uh, cooperation um, Bombardier then realized that it's really important to have really the hands-on, the powertrain as well and uh, Rotax became part of Bombardier. That is also how that we use for example parts that we have available to do this kind of a, in this case a nice coffee machine, so high quality and for sure we use this one for example for exhibitions and so on so that is something I also wanted to show you quickly on here. Perhaps there is some need also in the market outside for this kind of uh, uh, coffee machine installation. I'm so. sure there's enough people with an engineering heart that would love to have something like this in their kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> sure, Rotex is the heart of our product. So we produce the engines here at site. So and we deliver them to each location worldwide. So, um, and for example, we deliver it also to local uh, industrial um, engine users. So there you see the uh, fire brigade pump uh, on a company nearby here located Austria. So that is mainly this use that was already done in history. And from here on you see some of the products. It's not the full range. Uh, so for example also the marine stuff you don't see here. But for example we stand uh, start here with the land vehicles. We have here the Spider three-wheeler, so can m product. We have here the ATV uh, Outlander over here, so also another product, They're all powered with uh, Rotex engine. Um, and then the next you see over here our um, electric cart. That's one of these products going also electric. And the other thing is at the back is also for sure the aircraft engines. We tried also a bit to show how the engines are installed in this aircraft and that's why we have this fireball forward package over here uh, to see how such an engine will be installed uh, in an aircraft engine. And as we can see here, there's a lot of different products uh, using the Rotax engine. Could you tell us which branch actually has the highest percentage of, of sales? Coming from the heritage and we started off with the nice yellow snowmobile so there's a, a huge percentage of our of our uh, products going into uh, snowmobiles skidoos but we also are very present at uh, private watercraft which we call sidoo and uh, on a very very positive and well developing trend we do have all the offer products especially uh, the side by side vehicles you can yeah. refer to them as, as some sort of buggy right mm -hmm. a lot yeah. of horsepower a lot of suspension travel and really really fun to drive somewhere in the outback or in the desert. So actually the aviation side is only a very small fraction. I mean in terms of, um, especially in terms of uh, production volume, it's, it's really really small compared to the other products here. Maybe something I should add here, so our speciality here at the BRB Rotex 
is the powertrain itself. So it starts with the concept, with the design, with the industrialization, um, goes over to manufacturing, sourcing of parts as well, external parts, because naturally no one does everything on his own. And last but not least, it's the assembly operation of all powertrains, which we then use in our BRP products. And they run on different playgrounds like snow, water, uh, off-road, on-road and marine, for example, as well. Use this area to give a little bit of an overview uh, about our products that we develop uh, and manufacture here. In general, we can say that we currently do have around um, 33, I think, 33 engine types and around 130 executions. Executions then um, vary depending on which uh, vehicle the engine is being built in, right? So that's a huge number of uh, different variants as well, which needs to be handled in terms of sourcing and assembly operation, quality control. So that's one of our two-stroke engines, which is being used in the snowmobile application in our ski -dos. Might be interesting, um, especially also for people who are used to use two strokes in aviation. If you look at uh, the numbers here, here we do have a, a weight of around, I would say 40 kilograms, and it offers a power of 165 horsepower. But it's not an aviation engine, I have to say, but it's a very uh, responsive, sporty engine, and it's being used for the crazy guys going through powder snow with a lot of power and, and really having fun yeah. in the wilderness. If we move over here, coming to a different playground, so this is an engine from a Sea-Doo, so that's a private watercraft. Here we've been talking about the two-stroke engine, so that's now a four-stroke engine, uh, three cylinders that's mechanically loaded with a compressor, um, yielding a power of 260 in this uh, version, but uh, our current models go up to around 300 horsepower, so that's a lot of power for a small boat for two persons. And also, for sure, fulfills the promise of having a lot of fun on the water. Now moving to different playgrounds, um, and as I, as I explained earlier, we do also have road vehicles, on-road vehicles. So that's uh, the big engine block of a uh, Spider, which we saw over there. Uh, very nice engine, powerful, gives also a great riding experience. And uh, on the other hand side, uh, there is now an engine from the off-road section. That's a V engine with a variable belt transmission. It's being used in various off-road applications. <laughs> I don't know if I have to say a lot here. I think you, oh, you, you, you could even tell me stories about that, right? <laughs> We've done quite some fun flying on these uh, Rotex engines, but I'd love to, for you to explain how this process, as you mentioned, there's a lot of experience in manufacturing these other engines for completely different usages. How did you take, or how did the team take what the, they knew from these other engines and brought it into the aircraft engines? Mm -hmm. As we talked about earlier, there's uh, quite some, ch some differences uh, for the aircraft engine because there's a lot more uh, restrictions, I guess, for... Yeah, yeah. Could you explain that? I mean, of course, we, we always try to, you know, bring the know-how of other product line engines uh, into aviation as well. But we have to say there is a dedicated team of engineers working on them because, as you rightfully pointed out, there needs to be a lot of experience in order to design an engine. And uh, as we have here, the 912 ULS, that's, we we'll call it our workhorse as of today. I'll come to that later when we talk about injected engines as well. But. Uh, what is really unique, uh, what makes a difference compared to power sport engine, it's, it's the redundancy. So yes. there are several systems which are there, duplicated like the ignition, uh, spark plugs, uh, carburetors, stuff like that, which needs to be there in order to really serve the purpose to make the engine reliable and also... And follow the regulations. Follow the, the regulation. Engine. That's really important when it comes to certified engines as well. And maybe just to add a point to that, as you might know, all of our engines are available as ASTM certified engines or as fully, um, for example, EASA certified engines. At the end, the design and the product is the same. And here we do see a kart racing engine, that's a 125cc engine uh, with a two-speed gearbox attached to it with pedal shift. And that's being used in our national and international racing series. Uh, it's the Rotex Max Challenge and uh, the um, Let's say the yearly main competition definitely is then the Rotax Grand Finals, where we do have around four to 500 drivers always competing um, to be the best. 
it's also a, a really great product, especially if you ever have the chance to experience that sitting that close above the, the road and uh, feeling the power, go for it. So I think we're well set up for the tour right now after the first introduction. Uh, prior to starting our tour, we need to make sure that we uh, wear all protective uh, equipment like glasses. And uh, Osita, you've got some nice... How, how would you call them? I mean, uh, <laughs> look like castanets, but yeah. those are shoes. <laughs> for, um, for, for, for safety shoes, well, because we all have to wear safety shoes. And our guests come with their own shoes. But in order to beef them up a little bit in terms of protection, we always ask you to wear things like that. But also eye protection is very important because we are deeply convinced that you can only produce quality and focus on, on the product and the task at hand if you can be safe that uh, nothing threatening your personal health or safety. And we always want to make sure that people return in the same way or even better, right, uh, after work. Exactly, and the standard you set at your company or at your factory shows in the product you deliver. Exactly. Nice! Do a nice Irish step dance, right? Yeah. <laughs> Let's go! What we're going to see then in a minute in the background, that is our biggest assembly line here. So you will see there then uh, information how the engines get assembled. We have there all these autonomous vehicles where our employees, workers at the site uh, uh, go around. Uh, step by step the engine is getting assembled. So there it's a one straight line. There you have on the one side you get the supplier parts on there and then on the other side you get all the components done and these are put then together uh, with the engine, they go step by step further. There is then also a step where a leakage check is done with a special device. You might see some close-up. And there's a next step where the engine is then also finally checked with a final inspector. There are two nice robots doing this work for us. Um, and from there the engine will then go to the final packaging and went out then to our nice products. That is the way how the work is done. So you do the work step by step, do the hands on and for sure moves forward. And from here then the next section for the work is done. Uh, here. I am quite overwhelmed by everything that's happening here and there's so much autonomous work going on, lots of people on the production line, everyone has their task and it's just incredible to see what manpower is behind creating engines like this. Just a few seconds ago we saw that uh, once the engine has been produced uh, it needs to be checked, it was done by uh, some sort of visual check, uh, the final inspector with those two nice robot arms. But at the end of the day, the real truth is told when the engine is being used and fired up. And what you see here is uh, one of our engine test stands. Um, we do run our engines here in this test stand. It's done in a way where you can attach the engine in a very quick way because, you know, uh, we are producing the engines in sequence and we need to make sure that we can follow the sequence. So that's highly sophisticated and uh, I guess if you are glad we are even seeing um, a snapshot and some impressions of how such a test run looks like. So let's start the automated test sequence. Let's fire it up. Okay. Now the magic happens. So now we add fuel, air, electricity. So now the engine is, has to be connected. You, you need to connect uh, the lubrication. You need to connect fuel, electricity, uh, power takeoff, uh, controls, as well as exhaust fumes. Even um, uh, coolant needs to be put in there and once it's been started and everything is pre-warmed in terms of the liquids uh, it goes uh, through a dedicated testing program which of course varies between the different engine types and at the monitor you can see uh, all the values being acquired and all the steps which are being taken in order to really qualify this engine. In the background there's some sort of um, Testing running so we, we check for noise and vibration to see if there is any uh, abnormal sound or abnormal vibration which would point to an internal topic which would we have to dealt with. So what are you seeing here? So this is the place where we um, bring our engines after the final test run which is uh, done at two test stands in our engineering department in an even more sophisticated way than you saw before. Here we are talking about, I mean for the engines for power sport products, we are talking about the highly automated test run with a duration of, a, depending on the engine, a few minutes, right? 
But for the aviation engines, there's a higher level of test required also from our authorities. And typically we can test uh, in one shift around, I would say, eight carbureted engine. And when it comes to this really masterpiece, I guess it's the same as you have with the new aircraft, for right? Sure. Yeah, it's a 950 IS. It takes more effort because it's, there are more points to test. And it go, then goes down to maybe five engines per shift. Mm -hmm. And that tells you that there are a lot of things to be checked in. You know, you have to prove that uh, the performance is there. Uh, you have to do all required checks really to make sure that you are able to ship the engine. And after this testing, what are the last few steps before they really packed up and sent to the new, uh, new owner? It's adding accessories which are in the wooden engine crates, which might be even quite well known around the globe. The Rotax uh, wooden engine crate. I mean, adding accessories, but also cleaning up. Ah. Just have to <laughs> step aside. Our little friend is is on the way. <laughs> working hard. Yeah, working hard. Taking only a break if, some, if there is an obstacle, but maybe just I'm a little bit the <laughs> to the left. And uh, it also needs to be uh, prepared for shipment and reception on the, uh, at the custom end. And you need to clean up some things. Maybe some residues from uh, the test run. You need to tighten up the um, the cable harness, for example, and then of course uh, put it into a um, non-corrosive environment in such a bag, so that we are really able to make sure that we ship it in the right quality and it's also conserved for a longer period of storage. And from start to finish, how long does it take to make a single engine like this? And engine, well, for the 915 IS, I don't have the exact figures uh, on the top of my head, but for, let's say, for 912 ULS, it takes around the uh, duration of two hours, a little bit less maybe, yeah. But I have to say, and we will see that in a minute, not every piece is assembled directly at the assembly line, so we do have some pre-assemblies, gearbox, for example, or cylinder heads. Those parts are already assembled. Prior to being brought to the final assembly line, at the end of the day, you're building the crankcase with the crankshaft and attaching the sub assemblies, and this takes uh, around two hours. Right. I'm so impressed. That's <laughs> fast. <laughs> Amazing. What do we see here? So, that's also final inspection of the engine before the engine does leave the company. So here the engine is uh, well first inspected, uh, if all the uh, sequences were done right uh, and also the engine is then prepared uh, for the long term uh, shipment uh, later on. And for sure to be uh, safe, uh, to have all the parts uh, with the engine and all the sequences were done right, we also secure this information. Uh, that is done also with the computerized system with two cameras, I'll show you in a minute. And the colleague then will uh, start over here, the sequence done automatically. So the information is scanned. It is then put into the system. He starts the sequence, the table is lifting. So we will then start to turn automatically. We have over here two cameras which get each different angle done of the engine. And with this process we can make sure that each uh, step, each part, everything is on the engine as it should be end of the day. And there are three sequences done. The first one in this way like the engine is on the grate. A second step is done when you have all the parts, accessories which go within the grate and a final step that is also done together with the grate in order to be sure have a final picture that all the grate is safe and all the grate is good and then it's going out then with the forklift autonomously going out then to the delivery shop and from there you get the engines out to the field worldwide where our distributorship and out to the uh, original manufacturer, airplane manufacturers, so we should be then uh, having all the products we have around. around. Here's the way how we do our crankshafts, you know, some of these crankshafts are built crankshafts and uh, here you see the process how they are done, so they are pressed together, they need to be balanced in a proper style. So what I'm proud of really, here to show you now our aircraft assembly line, I think that's the information or the area you're most interested to. So let's just have a walk through the whole assembly line. I will show you what's about. Um, mainly the assembly line is structured in a roundabout. 
Uh, we all do our assembly processes in a counterclockwise style. Uh, it is so that uh, over here you get first set up all our crank cases in the first step. And from here it's set over then to the assembly line uh, here. And in this assembly line it's going then step by step. All parts are put together then from one piece to the other. You see each place does get then uh, his own screen, so you have all the information stored in the computer system. That is very important uh, for us and also for the maintenance and overhaul guys in field to have also a baseline for the information and have a baseline of the measurements and all the pre processes and sequences done during the assembly process. So, for example, here you see where the cylinder station is. All cylinders then go on to the engine. As a next step, you have the cylinder heads which go on to the engine. They are also pre-assembled in the component area. I show you then also as a next step, but let's go walk through in a further sequence. Here, more or less, the core engine is already done. So all the cylinder, cylinder heads, valve covers are on already. Also the gearbox is set over to here. As you see here the engine with the gearbox all around here. All oil pump already went on to the engine. So and water pump. So the engine gets complete and complete in the next few steps. Here you see the water pumps for example pre-assembled set over already from the component stations. Um, as a next step, we have all the area where we get all our ignition systems onto the engine. Again, as I mentioned, pre-assembled, so with the uh, electronic modules, intake manifolds, all really pre-prepared and set over to the engine. Here you see already the engine assembled with the ignition housing, electric starter and all the water pump, uh, the water system venting on there, expansion tank, everything is already set up here. So step by step the engines get then completed and um, all the components are getting on here and here we see then final step, final location where the carburetors then also will be set on to the engine. So with this we did a full circle to the engine uh, uh, assembly line itself. From here on I will show you two further topics. The one is where we do all these components to show you some of these highlights. And I also will show you where the turbocharged engine gets all his turbo systems on. Now as you have seen before we were to the assembly line itself. And here we go now through step by step some components that are interesting for sure for the guys and how it is done before they are set over to the assembly line. So here we start uh, with the crank case. Crank case is put together already with all the crank sh uh, shaft and uh, also camshaft, everything in there. And as I told you before, set over to the assembly line. The next component we do here is on the one side, uh, it is the cylinder heads. Here you see the chicks, so how they are done. And here you see already the pre-assembled uh, cylinder heads, how they will go on to the engine in a next step on the assembly line itself. And we jump out over here to the ignition housings. So the housings are also pre-assembled uh, with the stator, all the trigger coils, all, everything already on there. And again, this component will be set over to the assembly line as a next step. Here we do the engine uh, area where the engine is prepared for the engine test run. So that is a remote test cell where we do each single engine is running through the whole RPM band. Uh, and here it is prepared with all the water system, with all the exhaust system, with all the wires, uh, electric uh, starter and all the stuff uh, on here. And from here it is then brought up to the test cell, similar as the one you saw before. So what we see here is now the 
a final assembly of the turbocharged engines. Uh, as you have seen first, uh, we uh, do the base engine on the assembly line. And here it is set over then as a core engine. And all the final steps are done here then with all the exhaust system, with the turbocharger system. Uh, everything is put here uh, on this stand. Uh, and from here, the engine, as we saw, is then set over for the final test run. Now here in real, in the production, uh, here is mainly the crank cases and uh, the uh, cylinder heads. All this is done here with these multi-purpose machines, as I call them always. Uh, they are so nice. You just put in the uh, workpiece, the doors are closed, and from there the whole machining process does start. And the machines do hold a big uh, store of different special tools. And with these special tools, all the uh, steps are done which need to be done. For example, at the crankcase, they do the grinding of all the ceiling surfaces. They do all the bores such a piece has, all the threads. Everything is done by these kind of machines and is assembled for sure and the machine according to the drawing we get from our guys in-house doing the cut cam engineering. What I like here also is the three robots uh, showing how collaboration of robots could look like. What is done at this station, the big one in the middle, so the robot, he's just holding the piece, so it's mainly he's holding the crank, uh, the cylinder head. Uh, the left guy uh, is then getting the valve seat. Uh, first these seats are checked, then they are brought to a cryogenic pass uh, going down really to minus uh, zero, uh, to the absolute minus. And then just the ring is brought over here, the valve seat is brought in, just slide it in with the environmental temperature, just then put in and with that one you have a nice fit of the valve seat. And the other guy at the right side over here there one is bringing the um, valve guides. These valve guides are just then impressed in. And what I always show here is for sure how collaboration of these uh, robots could work and how automatization is really a value to put also our products into place. So get our uh, parts together. So mainly all information I can give you at this station. So what we do see here is all the crank cases. Uh, with the crank cases there is the issue, as you know, as the technicians know, uh, a crank case does always, uh, is a combination of the upper part, of a lower part, or with aircraft on the left and right side part. And as you know, that we have a crankshaft and we have a camshaft and all these need to be aligned very precise. So uh, this kind of crankcases need to be put together and always need to go together. And this is mainly done in this area. So the assembly process, again, assisted by robots that do all the sequence, the torque sequence, uh, according to their presets. So according to the torque and the torque sequence, they need to do so. And from here they are set in again on these machines. They are fully automatized process again uh, on where all the bores are done then with the full alignment on the combination of the parts. So that's our plasma coating assembly. So we use it to coat the, the inner linings of the cylinder. That's an technology which is coming uh, from the automotive industry and of course we also apply to our power sport engines. Very bright light, uh, it's a torch which is powered by uh, hydrogen and oxygen and it's uh, covered in, in an atmosphere of noble gas in order to uh, prevent uh, oxidation and within this high temperature flame which is around 10,000 degrees we inject iron powder and this iron powder li liquefies uh, immediately and is sprayed on the cylinder walls in, in a cylindrical movement as well. And that's not for aircraft engines? Right? That's not for aircraft engines. In the aircraft engines we do have a, do have a different treating for the cylinder line, other than the uh, nickel seal coating. Good. So far we have uh, walked through a machining park, mainly dedicated to aluminum machining. Now we are stepping into our um, steel machining for crankshafts, camshafts and other steel parts. So what you see here, our machining setup uh, for steel machining 
and it goes from here all the way down, right? And it's in a, done in a highly automated way. So at the beginning, just a second. So we start off with row parts like this. And the further down we go that aisle, you see lots of machines, right? The further down we go that aisle, the more complete crankshafts get and there are uh, different processes like uh, first you have to work on the ends of the crankshaft in order to be able to, to grab it firmly. Then of course there is some uh, milling operations, some lessening operation, drilling operations. Uh, for some crankshafts we need to even establish some gears on the part itself. And uh, the second last step is induction and hardening, which we will also see in a minute where we do harden specific parts of the crankshaft in order to make them more durable. Typically, typically this is done with the uh, bearing locations. What we do see here is a typical setup for one of those machining steps. And in order to, let's say, make the work more efficient and also safe for employees, uh, we put all of our materials on those trays. And those trays are put on trolleys. And each of those machining centers does hold the base where you can put in this stack of trays and the portal robots, you see them going over there, right? They automatically pick the uh, work pieces to be worked on, bring it into the machine, machining is done, and also the unloading and loading of a new part is done automatically. So I would suggest just to take a look also inside the machine because that's really fascinating. Well, here we see the process of machining this crankshaft has just started. The huge tools in operation and just to give you an idea one of those tools can be used for around 500 work pieces then it needs to be um, recalibrated refurbished and that's of course done in a on a frequent basis but well, this is very fascinating for me to see also the movement uh, of the milling tools because this is um, even even out of round so this is uh, not in the same rotation axis as the crankshaft itself. Some parts are even um, outside of this main center line. And still the machine is able to achieve the required um, preciseness. So here we are at the second last step of our machining operation. It's induction hardening. So it's necessary to treat some parts of the of the workpiece of the crankshaft uh, in a specific way in order to change material properties. And just let me grab one piece here. So you might see the different shining of the material. And this is exactly where the, uh, the induction hardening has taken place. So it's changing the material properties by heating it up to around 800 degrees. That's done by sending a lot of current through it and then shock cooling it to around 180, 200 degrees Celsius. And by this, uh, the crystallite structure of the metal changes. It gets uh, more durable. And this is exactly what is needed for those locations where we apply this technique. Uh, that's mainly the bearing location. And if you're lucky, we even see you see it starts to glow orange in a second and then it's cooled down. So here we are at our material lab. Let's split into two sections. Let's look through the bullseye here. Uh, first of all here we do have a um, lot of uh, 3D measuring machines where we check the dimensions of the parts which we produce and that's important for uh, various reasons. On the one hand side for engineering, also for uh, production when you're ramping up or to make sure that you during production are within the band of tolerance so you have to draw some periodic sample and recheck them all the time right in order to make sure really you only deliver the full quality those machines um, can be programmed to the part and they do the measurements on their own fully automatically so the program knows which part it is right because it's 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 created in 3d and the machine knows which points to check and measure. Fantastic. Can I, am I allowed to get this on screen? Just, just this uh, uh, j model? Just this one, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, what do we see here? You know, uh, as you have seen already, a lot of history. 
and almost this history, a lot of invention takes place. A lot of very innovative engineers in the company. And here we have in this entry area, we see the Wall of Fame, where all our inventions are shown on the patents we have around. Uh, so step by step, they are growing and growing even more. A lot of the clever heads and the engineers we have around here. We just had a very extensive tour through the factory and saw the entire production process. Are there a few things that we didn't see yet that are still on uh, site here that we uh, have missed? Yeah, I mean, beside the administrative part, which is honestly not as interesting to look at as uh, all the manufacturing assembly operations, we fully um, left out our R&D portion because, uh, it's, as I said earlier, it's um, really in our focus to develop engines, manufacture them and assemble them, but we were missing out the complete R&D portion and that's for a good reason, because we have to really protect our intellectual properties. Uh, there are, there's a huge amount of engineers working in a dedicated area of our site here and for obvious reasons we are not able to go in there because uh, it would be kind of a look into the future, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And you were saying something as well about apprentices working here? Correct, yeah. We were also passing by the Rotex Innovation Center. So there we all do our and hold our Rotex, um, sorry, Rick Academy. So where we do all the education on one side on the apprentices and on the other side also to do the internal uh, education. So lifelong learning is uh, something we really try hard to get with our employees. And what's fantastic is during the tour we saw different uh, stages. We focused lastly on the aviation side, which we as pilots are very interested in. And the few questions that I want to ask towards you both is what does the aviation industry look like now and what is Rotax's position? Mm -hmm. Well, coming from the starting point uh, of stepping into aviation, that's already decades ago, several decades ago, uh, we have developed ourselves uh, definitely and clearly to a market leading position, especially in the horsepower range we are in, between 80 and 141. With the 915 AS you are experiencing yourself. And uh, we are talking about the market penetration of 80% uh, plus. So we are clearly leading the pack there. And if we look at the engines you sell, what is currently the most popular engine? Mainly, yeah. as you have seen already at the entry area, that's the 912 ULS, the 100 horse engine. So that's the one that is, I think, most common in the field. But for sure, you see just recently the trend with the 915 IS injected technology, when we also get these uh, numbers in there. But sure, most popular so far, 912 ULS engine that you all know. Can you tell us something about new technology that is used to make more durable, more sustainable engines and shifting away from older technologies that we've seen for years in the aviation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of efficiency, one point which really stands out is uh, the way how we design our engines. It's not a big block engine uh, without the gearbox. That's a, a downsized engine. That's a trend you can see in automotive industries since also decades, I would say. You have to build small engines which run more efficiently, but with the gearbox we are able then to meet the sweet spot of uh, propeller RPM. And as you were also touching on the subject of uh, um, sustainability, right? We are also looking into synthetic aviation fuels. Uh, we want to make sure that all our engines are able to take also this fuel. No, that's, that's quite new, but still we we have to make sure that we are well aware of what's, what's ahead of us. And if we look further into the future of aviation engines, is there a clear shift to electric engines? Mm -hmm. I don't want to avoid that question, but let me start it from a different uh, point. I mean, for our power sport products, uh, we made it public that with uh, 2025, uh, we are going to see with each and every product line an electric product, right? So this means there is a massive buildup of know-how also on uh, e-mobility within our engineering, with, within the whole enterprise, right? And uh, of course, we are also willing to capitalize on that, but knowing that uh, the aviation business is kind of conservative, right? We just have to make sure that we get the right point in time where we then 
unveil what is uh, possible. Fantastic. I mean, earlier today we also saw the first electric cart that you have stationed here as well. And we also saw a SeaDoo motor that could uh, deliver 300 horsepower. Is that uh, also something we'll see in the future of the aviation aircraft engines? I'm not going to commit to any figures here, but um, also would like to tackle it in the way that if you look at our about on, on the segmentation of our products, right? Starting from an 80 horse uh, four-stroke engine up to top line product which you fly on your own. It's a 950 NAS with uh, 141 takeoff power. And also uh, taking into account that there is a, let's say, historical evolution from 80 to 141 horsepower. It's quite obvious where the trend is going and uh, of course uh, we, don't miss, we don't want to miss out on that one as well. I want to thank you both so much for the time you've put into showing us around, giving us a deep dive into what happens here at the factory. I think there's also a lot of viewers that want to know what you guys do and we as pilots are so excited to see the developments with aviation engines and to see that there's a very bright future ahead and what's happening now and to see how much you're building is just phenomenal. So thank you both very much. Rosita, also many thanks from our side. It was definitely a pleasure to give you the tour and uh, to also discuss on those topics you brought up and uh, I wish you all the best from the whole team here at uh, BAP Rotax because I know that you've got some journey ahead, right? Yes, we're taking the 915 from Austria all the way down to Johannesburg, South Africa, bringing the Sling Highwing home and so far we've had very much uh, positive experiences with the 915. The plane has been from South Africa all the way to Cape Verde through to the Bahamas, onto Oshkosh, it's seen half of the world already and uh, we're gonna bring it home and so far they've had no problems whatsoever. So Great, we're so massive supporters, yeah. supporters of what you do. Thumbs up and always <laughs> safe landing.